What's going on YouTube today? We are going to be doing another review video back to back. I know. Jeremy Lee from Sports Card Live is going in on an interview with Gary V. He just posted this and I want to do my reaction video. We're going to go through this really quick. Not as many stops as my last video. A couple of things before we get into the video though. If this is the first time you're checking me out. Thank you for doing so. I'd like to have you stick around, hit the subscribe, hit the like, drop some comments down below. Secondly, I actually do like Sports Card Live. I do not consume a lot of sports card content on YouTube. Too busy doing my own thing, but I also don't feel like a lot of content creators out there, whether whenever it comes to sports cards, are doing anything novel or adding any value to my entertainment consumption. I think that they're really just littering my uh, YouTube feed. So I don't really watch a lot of people, but I do like Sports Card Live's long form podcast views and conversations with all the people that he has had on there. So whether it be Nat Turner, etc., those to me are, are value add. So I like uh, that format. So. We're going to watch this. We're going to see what Gary V has to say. First time he's talked about sports cards in a while, and I'm curious. I've not watched this yet. So we're going to go through this and react. All right. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 170 of Sports Cards Live. This is dropping on Thursday, January the 26th. My name is Jeremy Lee. I want to thank all of our loyal viewers, podcast listeners, everyone who tunes in. Thank you so much. If you are not yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, please take a moment and do so. Special shout out today to Luke Lacardis and the Washington Capitals collaborating on some suicide prevention initiatives. Please support and visit cardsforsydney.com to get involved. Tonight's guest needs no introduction, so let's bring him right out. Gary Vaynerchuk, welcome to Sports Cards Live. How are you doing, pal? I'm well, brother. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Gary, it only took me about two and a half years to get you on the show. Welcome. Thank you for making the time. I got to do something somewhat ceremonial right off the bat. I got to grab that, take that off my wall. That's been up there for two and a half years, Gary. I'm very flattered, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. So listen, we don't have a ton of time. I'm going to jump right in. And I want to get your thoughts on the trajectory that the hobby has been through since 2019, the National in 2019, where I first met you through the pandemic to today. What are your thoughts? You know, I think an, it's an industry that got much broader uh, awareness. Much like many industries, sneakers, NFTs, cards, um, anything, social media, like markets. Um, it's a market that I think is in a really healthy, solidified place because it went through its underrated period, potentially its overrated period in this cycle. You know, we had the Maguire era. We had the 80s junk wax era. You have these moments where two, three, four years, but every time you look at it, I find like the industry evolves and gets stronger. Sports cards have been a thing in popular culture for obviously for over a hundred years and have had real understood value now for almost a half a century, right? And so you're gonna, like any market, it's gonna have its ebb and flow, contemporary art, you know, antiques, this is coins, stamps, you know, like things have their ebbs and flows, I think this last one was incredibly healthy and incredibly vulnerable, meaning vulnerable because like base cards of like speculative players, you know, you're going to get hurt on that. You're going to get hurt on those kind of things, just like I did with Todd Van Poppel and Brian Thomas, like uh, uh, Brian Taylor, excuse me, that, you know, that's, you saw that happening during this era, which is why I stayed very narrow because I learned in my teens and twenties about that on the flip side. The All right, jump in really quick. That is never going to change. What Gary is not really jumping into, and he may not necessarily have time, Brian Taylor and Todd Van Poppel did not have the buy-in that today's speculative players have. That's the problem that we had in the boom over the past couple of years. And I'm not going to blame Gary. Gary was a problem, but him speaking about cards, he can talk about whatever he wants. It's all the idiots that follow him. To be honest, idiots who are following him and going by his every words, whether it be the V friends, whether it be the NFTs, etc., they're the ones who are really the culprit here because they're following old father Gary, and they're also the same type of people who follow Grant Cardone, the masterminds of the hustle porn movement. They are the kings of it. So uh, whenever they say, hey, sports cards are a thing, you have people not doing their due diligence, which they need to be doing. You don't do something that you don't understand. Warren Buffett approach. You only do things that you understand. You learn about it. People were not doing their due diligence and making an appropriate buy-in. Like you can still buy Todd Van Poppel and Brian Taylor. They were, you know, highly touted prospects, but you have to tailor your buy-in. Like there is risk associated with buying that versus a Mickey Mantle 1952 tops, right? So 
Uh, that's something that really is different between what he's talking about. That's always going to be here. Buying speculative prospects is always going to be here. It's just right now the buy-in. If you buy a National Treasures RPA, if you buy a flawless RPA, if you buy any basketball player, I mean, just the third guy off the bench for the Atlanta Hawks, who happens to be a rookie, who is athletic, who has a 40-inch vertical leap, who runs a 4 5 four, six. Oh my God, he might be the next Kobe. No, he's not. He, he won't. So stop paying a couple thousand dollars for his NTRPA because you're going to lose your money. You're, you're going to lose your butt on it. So that's the problem with the people who have gotten in the hobby is the speculation. That was unhealthy. And I'm glad that it's, it's over. I think Gary knows that. He's just not articulating it in that way. The amount of people that have come into the industry is extraordinary. And so I think the hobby, and I've been watching the hobby pretty carefully now for the last year, I think it's in a very healthy place where it seems like there's rationale to things versus just Better. hyperbole. Um, and, you know, that's exciting and, and healthy. And, you know, I think um, it's been a moment. It, it will be just like I talk about the mid to late 80s and early 90s, right? The upper deck era, just like some people will speak about the Sammy Sosa, McGuire era, right? This is an era that will always be talked about in sports cards. When I'm 90, God willing, on some sort of podcast, maybe in the metaverse and VR, or who the hell knows where technology will be, you know, that 2018 to 22, 19 to 21, 2020, like that will be a thing. Was COVID, that thing that happened back then, a factor? What else was a factor? And so I think that's kind of, uh, that's how. I just gotta stop trying to push this metaverse bullshit. Please, human interaction, it's great. We love it. COVID sucked. Just human interaction. We like it. No metaverse BS. Continue. I see it. Yeah, I completely agree with you that the hobby's in a great place right now. We had a lot of transients come through over the past couple of years, and I think those that stick it out will be successful, and some of them left, and we're in a healthy place, uh, healthier than ever. Those those people that left, they're also chasing real estate, chasing NFT. Like, like And what's great is a lot of people that came in that might have left fell in love. Yeah. Right, like, like people don't talk about that when an industry gets a lot of awareness. Dude, <laughs> I can't, I can't. I'm sorry, I gotta stop. How can he go from both sides of the coin? He's the one who was the father of the NFT movement and pushing his V friends and pushing candy and, you know, fanatics divested sixty percent of their stock, their stock in uh, candy. So, and now he's saying, oh, these are the people, same people. You're the one who was that person. You were pushing sports cards and now you switched over to NFTs for a full two years and you didn't say a peep about sports cards. I'm sorry, guys. Sports cards are sports cards. NFTs are not cards. The fact that you, Father Gary, have coupled those together and all of your little minion followers have decided to marry those things together, they're not the same thing. You go to blowout forums, there's different conversations about NFTs. They're not the same thing. It's like talking about a refrigerator over there and my TV there. They're two totally different things. If I collect TVs, I don't collect refrigerators. Totally different things. Like, so it's so funny. He's going both sides right now. Both sides, both sides. Four minutes in, I'm already on a run. Sports is a very revered thing, and non-sports cards are always around pop culture, right? Like, you know, like, I'm just pumped to see how many people came in to be passer buyers and day traders, but have actually stayed. You know, because obviously, I'm, I'm aware of how present I was during that time, and, you know, a lot of people, acquaintances, former high school friends, young kids that followed me on social, so many of them have stayed in a very significant way. You know, for me, what, I, I mean, I'm, I'm looked at all the auctions this last Friday looking at, I bid on things, you know, the, you know the, very recently um, and are making my bets. I just got into a place where my profile got into a place where I realized me sharing things led to a lot of like, you know, like, just speculate, like just people making up story. It just got muckery. And so I was like, look, that's okay. Like, you know, do, does it suck? Cause I want to talk about the things I'm excited about. Sure. But am I, am I able to like execute and go to local? I actually have a little bit of sympathy for Gary whenever he says this. Cause I, I don't think that he is all about pumping and dumping cards. He's not about that. I mean, he's stated very early on, 
He's made enough money. Why would he need to pump and dump to make a couple million dollars on cards? He's done very well for himself making other pump and dump schemes or investment schemes. So like, fine. So I have a little bit of sympathy for Gary here where if he does just say one word, he tweets it out to his followers, De'Aaron Fox, like he did previously, Giannis Rookies, went up to $6,000 in PSA 10 form. I mean, it's just really, really hard for him to say, I like X, Y, and Z without causing a massive speculative bubble because he has such a lemmings group of followings. I mean, if you look at the V Friends video that I did over their first product, I was getting eviscerated by all of his followers in there who were like, you're not giving this thing a, a chance. I believe that Gary Vee is going to be the next Disney. He's going to outperform Disney. Well, I think Daily Wire is going to outperform Disney. Okay, all right, I'll just throw that at you. So I, I feel for him a little bit. Like as a collector, if somebody even wants to make a little bit of money on cards, just being back as, in his roots, I have some sympathy for him there. So I, I understand Card that. shops almost every weekend and... I'm so pumped for I was at the national in an aggressive way last year. A lot of V friend stuff, but was buying cards for my collection. Picked up another PSA 10 Jordan. Um, I'm also, I'm like, so I'm like already counting down the days to Chicago and I'm trying to find some strategies of like how to get back in a little bit more public without people speculating on the cards that I buy. Yeah, I think that's uh, one of my questions was going to be your with your level of influence. How do you feel about publicly sharing the cards that you are buying? And has it changed at all over the past few years? Because I see some of the controversy around you when you do this. And to me, it seems like you like you genuinely love the hobby. I see your passion at the national. I one of the things that attracts me to NFTs is all my wallets are public and people can see that I don't buy and sell. I buy what I want. Like and like the things that I'm excited about are like just very sound players. Like I don't try, like I'm not speculating on Bobo or like, you know. I tune out whenever I talk about NFTs. I could give literally two shits about NFTs. Why that is even being brought up, just sports cards. Purdy, you know what I mean? Like I like, to me, I learned those lessons in my teenage years. So when I was buying Giannis or LeBron or Jordan or, you know, Durant, these are like Pele. Like these are not things that are like, you know, that, that was probably what was toughest for me. I didn't anticipate, you know, cause I thought everything I was buying was so sound that it wouldn't feel like, and because I wasn't selling any of it, like I felt pretty confident, but like, I get it. Like, I mean, Jesus, when there's money involved, there's all sorts of shit going on. And I'm not naive to my, you know, the size and scale mm -hmm. of my audience. And so I'm desperately trying to figure out how to share my passion for it without creating speculation, I have not been able to figure that out. And I am i don't know how to answer that question either. I'm not gonna go on a big diatribe just to stop this video for that, but he's in a real pickle. I don't know how you share your hobby experience without really showing off the cards that you're passionate about. I just don't know how you do that. Um, I don't know. And so- At a loss. I'm trying to, Yeah. yeah. you know? I also have a fairly big baseball practice in Vayner Sports, and like it's very addicting to like sign a player and then like want to buy their first Bowmans because like you're literally that close to it. So, and I think that's pure speculation. No matter that's cool. I would do that if it was a client of mine. Absolutely. If I was an agent and I signed some big guy, yeah, I'd, I'd have his cards. I don't care if he's a no name guy. I'll, I would want his cards. That's actually really really cool. Or how good our draft picks are. You know, a Bowman first is as scary as it gets, especially if you go on the high end. You're spending real money on a very unlikely outcome. Most prospects don't get to where you want them to go. Um, so I don't know. Like, it's, um, I love sports cards. It's something that's been in me my whole life. I'm paying actually a lot of attention to it lately because of the calm, pricing feels more appropriate right now. And I'm trying to be thoughtful about it. Yeah, and like, I agree. And I did well, you know, you know, plenty of things that I own because I held everything are way down from their highs like anybody. Yeah. But I also bought early for a lot of stuff. It wasn't like I was buying at the highs or speculating. And so like, whether it's kabooms or vintage basketball cards or like, you know, like I feel pretty good about what I have and I'm excited about. I feel like that you are the creator of the kaboom push though because that insert has been around since 2013 nobody gave a crap about it as an ugly insert it's not all that novel i consider it literally the most overrated insert in the hobby today i get it there's people who like marvel i'm not a big marvel guy so maybe that's why i just don't personally like it 
Card, that's the thing. Their cards are for, for a little bit of everybody, but once somebody finds out that something is a thing, precious metal gem, a thing, star rubies, a thing, on-card autographs, a thing, exquisite art autographs, a thing, exquisite patches, a thing. Once th something becomes a thing, it's very hard for it to not be a thing. And I think that Gary, once people saw that he, he was buying some of these kabooms, he was one of the early adopters of that because he basically said, hey, this is going to be a Marvel-type card. I've never owned a Kaboom. Uh, actually, I think I may have one. It was either a downtown or a Kaboom. But it was in my homes. It's because I like my homes. I just wanted one of those. And I graded it, came back an eight, and I sold it. Not a fan of that set at all. There are so many better sets out there. But again, that goes back to that speculation thing where you know he may have bought something early, but he talked about it. Speculative bubble. It's still a thing. You know, like building on my collection going forward. Great. You said you're paying a lot of attention to right now. You're actually bidding on some cards. I don't know if you're aware, but on, on uh, every night, that every one Thursday per month when PWCC's premier auction ends, I cover, I do a live show on this channel with That's Adam cool. Gray at PWCC, and we talk about the items. I actually I want to invite you to come check I'm it out. Sit in the, tune in while you're looking at it. A lot of people do that. It, it's a lot of fun. I Where do you, what, what time do you do it at? We go live at 9.30 Eastern because it's the, the extended bidding starts at 10 o'clock Eastern. So we go That's live. We, we, we're on, Gary. We're on for like three and a half hours talking about all the items. It's a great. It's a lot of fun. So check That's it out. That's super neat. I will check that out one time. Right on. So where do you see the hobby heading in 2023 and beyond? Beyond ebbs and flows like any market that is around collectibles and art and things of that nature, 2023 is impossible because... We don't really have a good understanding of the stability or non-stability of the current economy. Like, you know, every day that 10,000 people get laid off at Google and Microsoft and Spotify is another person that makes good money that uses their disposable income to buy like a card that they've always wanted that's taking them off the board. That money comes off the board, that ends up dropping the prices and supply and demand. So. I think it could be, you know, if you told me cards are down another 30% off their high, I'd be like, uh-huh. If you told me we've hit the floor and you're going to see a 10% increase, I'd be like, uh-huh. Like the logic is there for me to understand either path. I agree with that. I am Agreed. not a, ma you know, when I got all hot years ago, I just saw it seven to 10 trends that were all colliding at the same time. Sneakers was a big part of it. I saw a lot of entrepreneurial sneaker kids not be able to get inventory anymore and were looking for something they could get inventory for. And I saw that clearly. I went to Cleveland National, you know, which was what, 18, right? Uh, I, 17 or 18. Yeah. yeah 17, right. 17, I think, or 18, right to your point. 17, I think. And I was able to like see it on the ground. I was like, ooh, these kids are like, you know, uh, basketball was ripping hot. You know, there was just like a lot of things happening. They were just also, in, I was buying Luca bases at 30 bucks. It was just like the buy-in was. Well, it was cheaper than that. 2018, Luca, you could literally get for $5 for the prison, if he's talking about the prison. And he actually wasn't, uh, didn't have cards in 2017. Unless he's talking about the 2016 Upper Deck Euro or 2017. I get his point. But yeah, in 2018, things were totally, totally different. Lower. Um, so, you know, I think that, um, I think that, that is not what I'm seeing now, which is like, it's super underpriced against demand that was coming. This is more like it's normalized and now the economic situation will have an impact. You know? One point on that. So this is the first time in the history of sports cards where the economy has actually had that impact because as we think back in 2008, a lot of people in the hobby, if you're watching this, good chance that you likely were not here in 2008. 2008 didn't really have that big of a ripple through the sports card hobby. Like, we didn't see crashes of Michael Jordan Fleer rookies. We didn't see crashes of Mickey Mantle rookies. We saw wax that was very low priced. Uh, we saw production that was cut because, you know, Tops didn't want to make a bunch of product that they couldn't sell. But at the same time, we didn't just see this outright crashing of prices. I actually have a spreadsheet whenever I was an undergrad flipping raw cards and some graded cards. I made 40% returns in 2008 in a crappy economy and it's because we did not have that speculation built in the prices and the values that we have now are so artificially high and speculated on which is why if if, if what gary says happens and that the well, he, he's not saying this but if the economy takes a nosedive 
we are more vulnerable in 2023 than we were in 2008. That is a fact because prices are still so much higher than they were. Now we have more demand. We have more people who are in it for the long term. We have more people in it for the short term. We have more people in it for money. There's just more audience now compared to 2008. But 2008, totally different story. We could weather that storm relatively easily. Grading was six, seven dollars a card. I mean, that didn't, you know, economy went, came and went. No adjustments to prices. Totally different environment in 2023. If I had a $100,000 card, which I do not, I would be worried. I would be sweating, especially if I don't have a very high net worth or if I have a lot of debt. That's a card that I would be offloading. That's why you see a lot of them hitting PWCC on the auction block. They're like, all right, time to get out. We rode this bubble. We're going to cash in and just sit on cash. That's been the mindset for the past couple of months and could continue moving forward with that economic uncertainty. To Gary's point, whenever all these things are colliding together, you could see it because the economy was thriving from 2016 to 2020, right before you know the pandemic. Dude, things were on fire. You just throw money at something and it turns into, you know, it magnifies and it multiplies. So yeah, a lot of people who had that keen vision for you know collectibles or just you know real estate, whatever, Things were going really, really good. But right now, we're on uncharted territory as it relates to sports cards and the uncertainty. Um, I do think that we're closer to a bottom. uh, But as Gary said, I agree with him. Things could go up 30%. Things could also go down 30%. Just it all depends on what happens with the economy. Credit card debt is at an all-time high. Consumer debt is at an all-time high. If people are using that for their uh, expenses to pay for goods, you know, food, etc., no bueno, because they're not going to be spending that money on sports cards. Eventually, discretionary spending does run out. So um, I'm seeing more of a flat lining, just boots on the ground. But again, the high end is going to continue to come down. That pressure is coming down with people offloading money. Because I don't think a lot of those people who own those cards are necessarily the high net worth individuals that we think. Yes, they're higher net worth. But they, they don't want to have substantial paper losses. They would rather just turn that into cash, buy assets uh, down on the cheap side. You know, and so I would say, I'm guessing, down another 30%, up a 10 to 20% generalization feels like my super guess of 2023. Uh, but that's All right. You guess. know, one comment you just said is that when somebody buys an item, they're now off the board, they don't need it anymore. And that's one of the issues I have with with relying on comps all the time is, well, yeah, that's the comp, but if the underbidder gets another, gets a copy or the the underbidder isn't competing now with the eventual winner, so the price might come down unless there are new participants and we're getting more and more people who wanna buy them. So there's that snowball effect of the hobby growing, more participants coming in. We've surely experienced that between 19 and 22, now we're kind of in a place where we're hoping to to uh, retain as many of these people. I agree with Jeremy, and I know he has limited time, but it goes even f- further than that. So if you think about it, as one person buys a card, it takes them out of the buyer pool. You need a second buyer to come in and buy it to keep that price stable and push it even higher. That means you need more buyers pushing it up, more people moving into the hobby. We're getting a double negative here. So once that buyer buys their card and leaves the market, we're forgetting PSA is grading a million cards a month. A lot of the demand is for graded cards. So unless you have a commodity card, a commodity card meaning it really doesn't really fluctuate with prices, it is the main card that people want to go after. Oftentimes what you'll see is, is once that one buyer leaves, PSA is also flooding the market with supply. So supply is just skyrocketing. So it's not only, okay, the buyer demand is softening, the supply is increasing. So these are two forces that are, uh, negatively impacting prices. So it's not healthy for prices. Supply goes up, prices are going to go down. Demand goes down, prices go down. That's a double whammy. So the fact that we're able to weather this storm, it just feels like things are tinkering. Like it is just feels so... Like if you gave it a little bit more oomph, a little bit more force on the negative side as it relates to pricing, things could break through and really crater. Just think, it feels like we're hanging on by a thread here. Um, with certain cards, uh, not all cards, but just certain cards. People that's, who can. that's the challenge of the hobby that I have a lot of empathy for, which is demand creation versus purity. You know, I have so much empathy. If you're a pure collector, literally have no thought of ever selling your cards, spike up moments are disappointing because the things you want go up. If you're an investor, which you're allowed to be, that I always thought was super interesting, like that people in the hobby on any direction. Like I hated when 
people that day traded and flipped would make fun of collectors. I'm like, why? Who are you to tell people what they want to do? But also on the flip side, if you're a collector, you know, what do you want? Like dictatorship? Like you don't want people to be allowed to buy something and sell it? Like it's really, it's really hard and I'm empathetic depending on what side someone sits on it. But, you know, to me, it's kind of like the baseball issue. The culture of baseball didn't allow Bryce Harper to like build the sports popularity. The humility and the tradition of baseball and hockey is a direct correlation to its popularity. That's why I like it. Oh, Gary, you're going to get me on a different rant here. That's why I hate the NBA because they don't have humility. They're zip. Keep it zipped. We're going to go off the rails. And, you know, one thing I was fascinated by... It's called being a decent effing human being, okay? Just, it's very easy to be a decent human and not suck. Unfortunately, what Gary is advocating for is in order to be popular, you have to suck. And you have to be a really shitty human. I'm just saying it like it is. That's today's culture. And that's all I'm going to say about it. I, with sports cards, it's like, oh, there's a lot of like, you know, it's almost like people want certain things from individuals or organizations that bring awareness to the hobby, but they don't want other things. And that's just not how life works. Like, you know, we don't get to pick and choose. Like, and so like, yeah, like that's what, you know, that's what happens. Like if you're gonna, if you're gonna tear down companies, media properties, organizations, individuals that are bringing awareness to the hobby, you know, there's gonna be an effect on how much new attention is on the hobby. And I wonder where he's going with this. I'm sorry, dude. You got to call out BS like it is. And that's not my job. I think Sports Card Radio out there does a good enough job of that. Maybe he goes a little bit extreme on it. But you got to also hold these people accountable. I'm sorry. We're going to call out BS whenever Tops and Fanatics or, and Pupini charge uh, way more value or way, way higher of prices for the value that they're putting in their packs. If they're inserting you know, the wrong Babe Ruth autograph. They're inserting a George Brett autograph on a Babe Ruth cut signature. We're going to call that crap out. We're going to call out the shady shield bidding that happens with it, whether it be PWCC, etc. The shadiness of this hobby is one of the growth aspects that needs to be exposed and overcome in order to attract people who don't feel like they're walking into a, a situation where the entire hobby is ran by a bunch of used car salesmen. So... I get what you're, what Gary is saying here. Like the more negative that you talk about sports cards, the less likely it is for people to get involved with it. But if we don't talk negative about it, all this shady crap that's taking place behind the scenes, people are going to continue to rip off new people who come into the hobby by selling them a bunch of garbage that they shouldn't be involved with anyway. And also, you know, there's just a lot of shady stuff that people are not aware of that needs to be brought to light. And I think we've done a pretty good job of that in the past two to three years. More of it needs to come to light. We're not done as a hobby in terms of that maturation process. But eventually we're going to get to a point where the industry does become much more healthier and much more accountable in terms of holding other people accountable for participating in the hobby and calling them out for just their shady ways. It, that's That has to happen in order to attract people into the hobby. I'm sorry, I don't want to attract a hobby uh, and bring in a bunch of parasites who are just you know feasting off of each other. I don't want that. I want good people who love the hobby, who love cards, who love sports, who like talking about it, who are not dicks that I can get along with. And whenever I see them at card shows, they can be like, hey, Tyler, you're awesome. I love checking out your videos. That's great. I love that type of stuff. I do not want shady people in the hobby. And I don't want to continue to hide behind or uh, prop, prop up people who are doing shady things. That stuff needs to be called out. So that, you know, impacts supply and demand curves and that might be a good thing or that might be a bad thing i don't really i you know i'm very detached for the from the gary v of it all i'm overly empathetic to people that make up stories about me like i'm, I'm being that serious it's because they love it like when some kid was that i knew was like telling somebody else like i bought a bunch of zions and i'm unloading them and i never bought a single zion because i had a big thesis that he was too injury prone and it was too high risk. And plus, Panini printed that. an ungodly amount of product that year, is my thought. You know, he was like Ken Griffey Jr. to me if everything went well. You know? Yeah. Um, that's, like, disappointing. But, like, I'm empathetic. Why? Like, people come from a place of scarcity and fear. 
Um, so for me, it's been easy, but I've watched a lot of people leave, a lot of companies leave because there's a lot of tearing down in the hobby, just like there is in every part. Like I don't think the hobby or the industry has any more tearing down than others. I just think it's small. Yeah. Small like when you, in politics, when you keep tearing down, politics are big. In social media, those are big. In Wall Street, they're big. I wish you would give examples here. That's, that's one thing. He needs to give examples. Who, who's getting tore down and it, it not working out? I think a, a lot of it's like if people crap on PSA, it's probably to make them better. If people crap on SGC, it's to make them better. If people crap on Beckett, it's to make them better. If people crap on tops, we have crap on the redemption process. If we have crap on the fact that Fanatics does not put real game used items in football cards. Patrick Mahomes is in his fifth freaking year and there's not a single game used jersey card that he has i swear i would drop four thousand not four thousand a thousand dollars four figures on a patrick mahomes game use patch card it does not exist tom brady had over 300 plus game use cards by the time he hit his fifth year patrick mahomes has zero real game use cards I'm sorry, Gary. I'm calling that crap out. I grew up in the hobby. Yes, you said you grew up that you know in the hobby. I wanted to be exactly like it was whenever I grew up. I don't want these companies to just keep ripping us off, charging higher prices, and not giving us value in packs and giving us giving us a bunch of stickers, ripping jerseys off Walmart racks, fanatics racks, and just cutting them up, not saying that they're game use because they're not. I don't want that. I want to hold people accountable and make this this thing better. So and I haven't done a lot of this content. This is me coming out unfiltered and like bottled up like, all right, you see my grading reveals, you see all my ROI, like, et cetera. But I'm very pissed off about what, what's happening with the companies, what's happening with the distributors, what's happening with the incestuous relationships, what's happening with all the explosion of grading companies that we don't need. I'm not too upset about those. Like they're entrepreneurial. If they can make money, let them make money. But I'm not going to support them because, you know, there's no need for them here. So if you want to call that tearing down for, you know, directed at me, which you likely have never watched my channel, which is fine. Um, if that's what you're talking about, I get it. If you're talking about maybe what Sports Card Radio does where he tears down some people, I think that there may be a little bit of element of truth to that. But what SCR does is he holds people accountable. So I'm not going to say don't do that because what he does is does bring to, to light certain things that need to be brought to light. Maybe in the manner that he shouldn't do so. He should probably dial back his rhetoric a little bit. Big. In sports cards, if you turn away 13 to 50 organizations or people, that could have an impact. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So as we as we wrap up, just one or two more minutes, Gary, you mentioned you'll be at the National in Chicago in July, August. Are you going to be at the Mint Collective or the Burbank show in February? No, I'm like, my schedule's really tough. I want to get to a Dallas show that's been on. My, I really want to get to a Dallas show. I'm going to some local shows in Jersey and New York. Nice. I'm just between family allocation. Like, I think people forget that I run a 2,000 person company in VaynerX. B Friends is a real, real, you know, time constraint. I got a lot to do there with building out that intellectual property. Uh, I'm, the, the card stuff I've been, to, by the way, th that's been super fun for me. The cards and be friends like two passions of mine colliding has been super fun but the national is a commitment that i like lock in um and then like i really want to get to one dallas show this year that was like a priority of mine maybe the fall and then i'm going to like the westchester and like northern jersey stuff so keeping a you know trying to and honestly very like i kind of like at this point in my life it's a little bit of like this you know like i'm trying to i just Honestly, I just want to provide value and I don't want to provide distraction. And I was really happy with the value I was able to create. But then at some point, I'm empathetic that it became a little bit bigger. And then like, I don't, I have no interest in creating anything that people perceive as negative. So I'm trying to stay pretty incognito in those shows. And then at the national, I want to bring as many people from my universe to the national because yeah, they may want to come and take a selfie with me but I'm hoping it leads to them discovering the love of this and they pick up a Nolan Ryan rookie from that dealer or they, you know, that, that, that was incredibly satisfying for me in the last couple of years. People literally just coming, driving three hours to Atlantic City to ask me a business question. They come, they take a selfie business question and then four hours later, like no interest in cards. And then four hours later, they came back to my table and they're like, I bought this. I was like, you bought a Tom Seaver rookie card? It was my favorite picture when I was like, like that's when I'm like, oh, I'm having a positive impact on the market.
Right on. Well, I saw your booth at the Nationals last year. It was low key. It was great. Your passion exudes uh, from me as a lifelong passionate collector. Do me one favor before we sign off. Give a shout out to my buddy, Jason. We call him the Worm Dog. He's a big fan of yours. Worm Dog, thank you for the love. I hope I see you a bunch of times at these shows and throughout the upcoming years, my friend. Right on. Thanks a lot for joining, Here's Gary. Up. Have a great yeah. one. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, just very quick summary at the very end. I agree with roughly 90% of what Gary Vee has to say. There's a couple of different things on here that we disagree with in terms of you know holding people accountable, et cetera. Also his impact on you know the speculative bubble that we're in and maybe some of the responsibility. I think that he is self-aware enough to know that. Going back and forth with NFTs, sorry, dude, you, you're like the father of that. And I think that you do have to take some responsibility in terms of your followers who have gone from, you know, following you to, you know, the sneaker culture, which you've been really big into, to uh, parlaying into NFTs. I mean, they're following you almost like the eye of Sauron, like whatever you're looking at is hot. And then everything else is just dead and black and, you know, not, not hot whatsoever. So like your eye is the eye of Sauron and whatever you're looking at and highlighting just blows up in value because you have a lot of lemmings that are following you. That's just my take on it. I think that you're aware of that, though. So I don't really know what the best advice is in terms of, you know, having Gary participate in the hobby and not cost speculation. I have a little bit of a sympathy for him there. But otherwise, this is a great interview. I know Jeremy's short on time. Jeremy always does a really good job. Again, I, I like his show. I think that he does a really, he's level-headed, has a good uh, head on his shoulders, a uh, true collector, it sounds like, as well. So always enjoyed this, and I enjoyed this. I, would, I actually would like to hear Gary talk more about sports cards. I'm not one of these people that says, go away, um, et cetera. Do it in such a way that's a little bit more responsible in terms of not causing speculative bubbles. He can navigate that probably better than uh, maybe anybody. But great interview, and that's all I got. See you guys.